My name is Milos, and I, I'm come from, I come from Serbia, from Novi Sad. It's a small city in the north, and I work for a Canadian company called Counterpath. What we do is a VoIP apps. We, so we do calls, chat, video, so on. And um, what's very interesting for the company is that we resell. So we have a template app, and we resell it to customers. We also have a retail version, but it's not very popular. And so we have a lot of different funny demands from customers. Uh, I'm working on, on this Android project. Uh, at this time, we have two separate projects, one for smartphone, one for tablet. It was a political decision by management. Uh, and we're trying to merge that into one project. And so we were looking through, looking through the Android framework and what Android offers. And we figured that with uh, our code base, which is over 1 million lines of code, uh, it's probably not possible. I'm going to talk about problems we encountered with using Android framework uh, and how we solved some of those problems. And hopefully, some of you will uh, catch me later and tell me, hey, you missed this, or you did this great. So I'm looking for feedback as well. So let's go. Uh, through a visual introduction first. So what does it mean to have a modular UI? Uh, what I mean by that is, first of all, to have responsive layouts. Uh, basically, in this image, we just manage the padding uh, depending on the device we run on. Um, second, we, uh, apart from managing the padding, we also move the view. So this is something, uh, it, this is very difficult to do, so probably, a lot of people would create a new layout and just move the button. Um, I'll talk about this later. I, I, I like styles, so I would do more styles, less layouts. Um, next up is show different item lists on different devices. So if you have a lot of space, you can just reflow. You can show the items differently, like here. So if you, if you have more space, why not show more content? Uh, Further on, uh, we have runtime configurable layouts. For example, in this sample app, uh, this layout is when you rotate it, it's, it detects that it's running uh, on a tablet in landscape mode, and it just behaves differently. So uh, it's a very similar example on this slide. Um, and one more thing is di displaying the same content in different containers. What I mean by that is like you have a bigger dialogue on tablet. Uh, again, try to show more text. Maybe try to show mo uh, one more label, two more labels with their descriptions. Maybe show more buttons. And our new best friend, split screen. So we need to keep, basically now we have to keep every layout we build uh, we, we have to keep it scrollable vertically and not mess it up. I mean, you can disable it, but uh, so this is the app I'm working on. Uh, on the left side, you can see the smartphone version. Uh, it has the bottom navigation, similar to what iPhone uh, does natively. Um, and on, on the tablet devices, we because it's a different app today, uh, we just built, built it from scratch. And we're, we're trying to eliminate that. So as, as you can see, it behaves completely differently. So the dialer pops up, settings pop up, um, calls. When you have a call, it also appears as an overlay. It's not a new activity. It appears as an overlay. Um, so a lot of problems. And uh, here's, here are some solutions. Uh, Android SDK helps with screen sizes. So small, normal, large, extra large, and so on. It helps with aspect ratio. Uh, I've read somewhere that one of these two actually started working only on Android 3.2 or 3.1, some, some strange version. So we, we don't use these. Uh, device orientation, we all obviously use this. Also, also we use screen densities for, uh, for drawables, mostly. Uh, now, with vector drawables, we'll try to uh, migrate, but since we brand our app for customers, it's very difficult to ask customers to provide vectors. It's it's also a huge issue. Um, and uh, also Android provides density pixels. It's a great help. You don't need, obviously, you don't need to multiply yourself. And the best uh, part of this is precise screen sizes. So with height, 
in DP and the smallest width. Uh, basic examples are, so for the values lander and portrait, if, if you omit the port modifier, it just by default goes there. So the land and portrait. Then for, uh, for small tablets, seven and eight inch tablets, we use 600 DP limit. It, it's been proven in practice that this is a good limit. You can just ignore uh, small Chinese devices that don't work. Like it's really, for us, it's really a small number of devices that are not falling into these three categories. And the third one is uh, large tablets. This is smallest with 720 DP. So Android does help a lot. Uh, but what we uh, managed to do is make a mess out of it because we created a lot of layouts and we created almost zero styles. So we kind of fixed that. So styles are similar to what CSS offers for web. Uh, you can define a style, you can reuse it. So we reuse it. We uh, add the qualifiers, so for landscape we add more padding, for portrait we remove padding completely, so on. So we had, we can use one layout and just apply different styles for that screen. And a good practice we generally do is print and slice UI on paper. Uh, it may seem like a silly thing to do, but it's very, actually very interesting to see around and our designer really loves it. So we're, we're doing it and it helps us visualize which parts of UI should be self-contained components. Uh, next up is the sub layouts we use. So generally that would be fragments in, in normal Android world. So we, we uh, put them in static containers. We don't add uh, their containers dynamically. So we try to define in the main layout a few static containers where our screeners will go and uh, we try not to change them. Um, also, we try to use the phone UI in tablet containers as much as possible. So if we built the contact list screen once for smartphones, we try not to do it again for tablets. So previously we did that and now we're trying to avoid and keep it all uh, in the same place. Um, when it comes to architecture, we tried MVC. What we did, uh, so the model was SQLite shared preferences, so on. Uh, in the view layer, we just put obviously the layout and we used, for example, the fragments. And then the main activity or some specific controller behaved like the, the controller layer, which was awful because main activity got to some, I don't know, 15,000 lines of code. So mad, we, we avoided. So we destroyed that class and wrote it from scratch. So then what we found out that we can maybe do the MVVM where we again kept the model the same and in the view layer we put obviously the layout. We also uh, put the views and view groups there and uh, we put the fragments in the view layer and in the model layer we had this thing called um, account list fragment UI model which was weird for us. Um, it caused, because we have I don't know, an average app has maybe 10, 20 screens. We have over 70. So it's, it's a big deal when we have, every time we need, when, when we create a part of UI, we have to create a model for it. And every sub part would have its own model. So it grows exponentially and it was awful. And finally, we realized that MVP was something that can uh, help us out a lot. So what, uh, and in MVP, generally, in the view layer, we keep the layout, viewers and view groups, and the, as the presenter layout. So this is sort of true. Uh, we use the fragments and main activity. I'll explain later why it's not completely true. Um, so there are two variations. We are somewhere in between, because for some screens, we use the passive view variant, and for some screens, we use the supervising controller variant. Uh, it depends on, fun on the functionality. Uh, it's simply because I believe that you don't need to pick one. Like if it works well with the supervising controller variant, use that. Like it, for us, it depended on the use case. Um, so the components for Android, this is how we divided them. The one marked with a plus are the new components uh, we invented 
and included in this framework. I'll talk about those in a bit. If if you watch, if you take a look at the slides later, this will be uh, this will be very clear. So the first problem with uh, dividing components into these three layers uh, was the lifecycle because the service, the activity, fragment, dialog, application, all all of them have uh, different life cycles. It's it's very native to Android, and a lot of people are okay with that. But when you have such a big app with external dependencies and runtime configurations that change, uh, that are provisioned from the server, it's very difficult to change the UI instantly and not mess up with the states. So the question was whether we wanted to create a new custom UI entity. We did it anyway. and. The it caused a lot of pain for us in the beginning, uh, but it was because it was unreliable. We had bugs. We we wanted to do it with AppCompat, and that was also a, a big problem because we not everything was public in AppCompat, and we wanted to extend everything, so on. We had some weird uh, problems with lower APIs, or even with Android six. Some stuff was changed between 6 and 601, and we had bugs with it. We couldn't find them. So we had a lot of pain in the beginning. We also tried to use fragments that we we had problems with the caching, and then it saves instant states, sometimes, sometimes not. So it was, all in all, it was unreliable for what we were trying to achieve. Um, we decided to move away from the Android APIs. This may seem like a radical decision, but we had some spare time uh, between client requests, so uh, we decided to do it. So this is something I found on, on the internet. It's the complete fragment lifecycle. It looks awful, and when you add our custom UI entities into all of this, it gets even more complex. So you can probably imagine it was around six months to one year of active work on this to get it to work uh, as we wanted to. Um, the first problem we solved was the recycler view. We didn't like the, the pattern Android used for the lists. They somehow managed to, <clears throat> to merge um, UI and data into one structure and they call it the adapter. So we didn't like that. We wanted a separate structure that would manage, fetch, prepare, update, whatever, uh, only only deal with the data, and have another component that would only deal with the UI. Uh, so we decided to decouple what Android uh, Recycler View offers. I mean, this is this is a smaller list, but the main components are listed, and we wanted to split the adapter component because it was the most important one for us. We split it into two uh, different uh, components that had uh, no dependencies between each other. So you could add a data provider to the adapter, but you couldn't uh, add the adapter to the data provider. So the recycler adapter would say, okay, um, here's the image. So recycler view would say, okay, I need to, to show the items, and it goes to the adapter. Adapter tries the cache, it fails. Uh, so what it does is asks the data provider, hey, can you give me some data? And the data provider says, okay, goes to the model, fetches the data, gives it back to the adapter, and then the adapter places, creates the views and places them into cache. So the next time something updates, we don't need act to actually uh, update the whole structure. We know which item updated. We know the exact item. We can even find the index, and we update only that one item. For, uh, for example, this was really useful for us because we had a few different lists with uh, persons, so uh, contacts, uh, online friends, third type of friends, um, people who are who, who you, could, you could invite to use the app. And a lot of these people had the same display things. So we, we would display uh, the name, we would display the picture, we would display the status for him. Uh, and we figured, okay, 
but we can just change the data. When he switches to one or the other type, we could just change the data and reuse the adapter. So we would avoid extra inflation, we would avoid extra layout and measuring. So, and, and the most important thing for us was we would completely decouple UI code from uh, the data management. So uh, this is the recycler. And then we had a huge discussion over how to fetch data that needed to be fetched asynchronously. Uh, obviously, all UI events had to go to the UI thread. Uh, and the long operations, wanted, we, we wanted to put them on the background thread. Uh, somebody already mentioned today that when you create a service, it doesn't actually run on a background thread. It runs on the UI thread, which is weird, but it works like that. Um, and even if you spawn it on, on a background thread, when something happens, uh, a user interaction, for example, uh, and you want to do something with the service, by default, uh, that interaction happened on the UI thread. And when you invoke something on the service, even though it was created on a background thread, the operation would go on the UI thread. So we would then need to delegate stuff, uh, post it on the background thread, then post it back. And then you get in the debug hell where you can't find uh, where your event came from, so on. So what we figured, uh, maybe we should use a, a library for this. Um, so async tasks are were a definite no-go for us. It was it was really painful to manage them, and it, it caused a lot of memory leaks and so on. Uh, we tried RxJava for for a while, but it was uh, not something we wanted because we have our own SDK that manages the events for us, and we get the events uh, already chewed up. We we just uh, use them, so this is not something uh, we could work with. And uh, then we thought maybe we could use an event bus. Uh, we tried auto. We, auto didn't work for us because it doesn't have syntax check. Maybe it does now, but at the moment when we tried it, it didn't have. Uh, green robot was okay, but somehow we decided to deal ourselves, uh, deal with with the events ourselves. So we created our own uh, event bus that would work well with our SDK and our presenter layer and post the events properly back to the UI. And general advice is uh, try to keep it minimal for your needs. Our app is really complex and this is something that works for us. It may not work for everyone. Um, so the main part of the framework is uh, something we call pages. I use terms page, screen, sometimes I will say fragment, but Whenever I say something like that, I mean uh, a self-contained block of UI that just deals with UI, doesn't do anything else. It's plain stupid UI. Um, it has its own presenter. It's mapped one-to-one -one with its own presenter. Uh, presenter is prepared data for those pages. What this means is uh, we don't say, okay, get me contact list. We we, we create an adapter, we create a data provider for that adapter, and then we fill in the, the data in that data provider from the presenter. So the presenter communicates with the data component of the list, and the data component of the list notifies the UI component, which is the adapter, so the adapter updates itself. So it's somehow decoupled. It's, it took a lot of time to decouple everything, um, also, what we did is internally, we handle dialogues inside of pages. So in Android, you just say uh, new dialogue dot show, and you hope that activity will manage it properly. But if you have data that updates, for example, uh, you have you want to add somebody to your contact list who you just had a call with. You, you say, okay, add to contact list. So the contact list pops up, and then the Google contacts in sync kicks in and deletes a bunch of contacts. So your list needs to be updated in real time. So if, if Google deletes all of your, con or adds 20 new contacts, you have to keep everything updated. So we decided to handle dialogues internally. Uh, we Yes, we had complex dialogues. So what we decided to do is, just create a new dialogue and then put a page inside the dialogue. 
and that dialog would then contain a page which is mapped one to one to its presenter and the data gets updated automatically. So it's completely decoupled, but it's easy to use. Um, and then the final decision was uh, to keep the presenters alive. A lot of frameworks I saw uh, actually create the presenters from scratch, uh, but because we have a lot of screens, we have a lot of data, we decided to keep the presenters alive at all times, so when the screen um, comes alive next time, it will already have the data prepared. It won't fetch the data again. It will be ready. It will just need to do the regular layout measure and draw cycle. Uh, and the general advice for pages is to try to instantiate them in one place. That means that we didn't like the mechanism where you always say new account list fragment and then put fragment over there. We didn't like that because uh, people created it everywhere with different constructor parameters, with different arguments. Uh, it created a lot of pain when you get a bug. We couldn't uh, find out where, it, uh, where the fragment is originated from. So uh, we, created, we create pages in one place and that component, um, I'll skip over this, it's not important. So that component is, I'll skip this, I'll go back. So this is important. So this component is called the page manager. What it does basically is uh, it knows about the containers in the app. It knows how to put pages there. It knows how to instantiate pages. It knows when and uh, whether to destroy them. So it's similar to what Fragment Manager does, but it's, uh, it's a decoupled mechanism for showing and hiding, and it doesn't deal with cache. It doesn't deal with uh, providing bundles to, to, to the pages. It just creates them with the given set of parameters. And uh, I'll go back to this. So the important thing about intents, uh, we wanted to show specific pages when an intent comes. So we decided to handle all, all intents in one place. That means that uh, we needed a special component that's called the intent handler. Uh, the intent, intent handler would invoke, it would try to handle the intent that came in, in on create of the activity. But if it fails, uh, for example, screens are not ready, navigation hasn't initiated yet, something is not ready, whatever, uh, it, it waits and waits until the onResume method is called. Uh, when an onResume method is called, and if we are, for example, not logged in, uh, we, we added another component called the activity resolver that would tell us, okay, you need to go to login activity. Okay, you need to go to the splash activity. Okay, you need to go to the welcome wizard activity. You need to go wherever. So a lot of components, a lot of decoupling, but this allows, allowed us to uh, really make the Android UI very modular, which by default it is not. Um, so we defined a few rules to keep our UI code clean. So the first one is to enumerate the pages. I, I've read somewhere that enums are now optimized by the compiler, that may or may not be true. Uh, but you can always use the int def if you want to. Um, so you enumerate pages, put them all in the same place, uh, give them a common navigation API before they are creating. Um, I'll, I'll just show you an example here. Uh, the framework deals, as I've said before, with creating and caching pages, but not the component that actually puts them into containers. Uh, UI would always follow the activity lifecycle, which fragment does not. If you call uh, put fragment in your on create method, your fragment would go through all of the states. It will go to create, create view, start, resume. Even though your activity is not resumed, your fragment would be resumed. Uh, we felt that was weird. So our 
our pages follow the activity lifecycle. If the activity lifecycle is in the on start state, we wouldn't go past that state. We wouldn't go to the on resume. It solved a lot of issues. Um, so this is how our navigation code looks from a page on click, for example. You will say navigate with give it a bundle to pages.login. This means that navigate will return you the navigation interface. Uh, with bundle would allow you to set a number of parameters, whichever you like, and to call would just create the page or pull it from cache if necessary. Which page? The one you enumerated easily. So it would create it, cache it, and it would uh, know how and where to put the page. So this is very important because on, on tablets, we show the dialer as a pop-up. On smartphone, we, we show the dialer as a, as, a, as a page in the view pager. So it's completely different. You would probably need to create, uh, I don't know, a, a completely new fragment that deals with this. And uh, so let's skip over the fragment manager. Yeah, and so the components that solve solves the, the issue of uh, navigation is something we call the coordinator. Uh, it's used to decouple navigation from the pages, and it allows us to specify the layout. Uh, so the coordinator is something smaller than the activity, but bigger than a page. Uh, it knows how to use the page manager to hide and show pages. It knows where the, core, uh, where the containers are. Uh, it knows how to handle back and up. So on tablets, if you have a pop-up, when you press back, we expect uh, the pop-up to be closed. But on a smartphone, if you're on the dialer in a view pager, when you press back, we expect the app to go to background. Uh, the same thing goes for up. On tablet, we don't provide the up navigation for the details pane. So if, you're, uh, if you have, on the left side, you have a, a contact list, you click on a contact. On the right side, we display the details for that contact. We don't, we don't allow you to go up. There's no up from that place. But on smartphones, if you click on the contact, you go into contact details and it's, it's in full screen. So we need to allow uh, the user to go up. So when he presses up, he goes back to the contact list. So the coordinator is, is the component that manages all of that. It also holds the intent handler component. Uh, why? Because when an intent comes in, uh, such as you have a missed call, you click on the notification, we want to show the call log. Uh, that would, how, how else would we know uh, the, where is the navigation interface? So the coordinator is the component that knows basically everything about your UI. Uh, it's, it's also a page, a sort of a super page. It has its own presenter. Uh, and the thing we can do with the coordinator, we can create a few instances of the coordinator. For example, a tablet coordinator and a, a phone coordinator. Uh, so two distinct components that use the same navigation interface, but a different implementation of it. They use the same screens, but they put them in, in different places. Uh, and it basically allows you to have a completely different app on tablets by just creating one more class. And from the main activity that was over 15,000 lines, uh, our main activity is now 200 lines. Phone coordinator is around 500 lines and tablet is around 400 lines. So yes, we have a lot of code around. We have a lot of components, but the main, uh, the main logic where, where you navigate, where you create lists, where you go around the app, uh, it's much easier to maintain and much easier to read. So a visible, uh, so for this visible UI on phones, this is how it layers in, into pages. So the coordinator in this example would uh, contain the, the top toolbar and the left minibar. And then it will have two pages. One would be displayed in the navigation sidebar and the other would be displayed in the center. So this is three pages for us. Th this is why I said we, we slice it 
on paper and we can easily see uh, which page goes where. And for a tablet, for example, uh, the coordinator is the big thing. It has the blue line on top, it has the fav. Um, it also has a list page on the left. It has the details page on the right. So the list page would here say navigate with bundle and then put the contact ID into bundle and say go to contact details. And on phones, uh, the contact de the coordinator would, would know to display the contact details in full screen. On tablet, it would know to display the contact detail details uh, on the right. So it's, it's a common navigation API. So to keep pages modular, this was, af after everything said, this was probably the biggest challenge for us because we have a lot of brands that are, uh, that have weird requests and they always want their features to be exaggerated. For example, they want a, they want a big lo logo in the middle. Uh, they want the big title and we don't show it for 90% brands. So we would then need to create uh, maybe an if. So we would say if this big logo thing is enabled, increase the logo size or something like that. So we had a lot of if else branches and uh, we tried once with custom views and that was that was also bad because we had i don't know like 50 custom views that i mean that may not be really bad for a normal app but this one was huge and managing all those custom views with all those sub cases it was crazy so we we decided to have a distinct page for uh, each ui uh, component and we added another thing called page resolver that would kick in when you call navigate.withbundle.2 and you say which page. And then the page resolver would give you, it would actually resolve the page you should go to. So if, if it's running on a tablet and the client wanted to have a big logo, you would just say go to login page and we would know, okay, show the big logo tablet login page. So something just to uh, get keep our uh, keep our code minimal and uh, help us uh, create less bugs. And just to mention the drawbacks of this, so this is a lot of decoupling, a lot of cosmetic work. So as I've said, it's six months to one year of just building this. Uh, a lot of method references. If you're close, we have our. Uh, 100,000, so we blew past the 65K limit a while back. So this adds a lot of method references, around 10,000. If you're at 50,000, then this is a problem. Uh, it's difficult to switch to. If you already have an app that uses fragments, if you already have an app that's just basically done, yes, this is difficult to switch to. Uh, it makes sense only for complex UIs, it doesn't make sense for a, a, an app that has two screens that are always the same. So this is just not, not for that use case. Uh, we also needed to, uh, to increase team education because nobody really wanted to learn how to use it. Um, so this was a, a pain for itself. Um, and the last but not least is the limited support. This is not yet open source. We want to open source it, uh, but we're just uh, thinking how many apps are there really that need a big complex framework like this. So basically what I'm looking for is uh, people who are interested in having this open source and uh, hopefully somebody would contribute um, and help us uh, make, it, make this a lot better. So to recap, we built self-maintained UI components called pages, they, they hold the layout, they deal with the UI only. Uh, data is always prepared in presenters. Presenters are also dealing only with the data. They don't know anything about the UI. Uh, intent handling happens in one place. Uh, page resolvers uh, help with modular UIs. So if you have sub brands, brands, uh, specific requests, um, runtime changes, for example, a server change comes in, uh, you can just 
say refresh page and the framework will automatically know which page to show depending on the new setting you just got. Um, and the most importantly, completely separate navigation mechanism. And to wrap it all up, we created a coordinator component that would uh, serve as a super page, super screen for all of this. Um, and we're working on having a coordinator for each screen variant to support phones and small tablets and small tablets in landscape and create a different navigation for all of those devices. So this is a lot of work, but just to mention it. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'd like to hear them. If you have feedback, I'd like to hear it. 